So today I thought I would do something a bit different, something on a slightly new theme. Um, it's all linked to my previous video about the Primrose Nature Reserve which has just opened up in my hometown Clitheroe. It doesn't sound on the surface of it like it's got anything to do with family history but everything is connected somewhere. My talk a Tale of a Teacher, which I live streamed during the lockdown last year, which I will put a link to, was inspired by a chance find when I was trying to understand a bit more about the lives of the teachers who worked at my old primary school in Clitheroe. But that live stream mentions a dramatic event in Accrington. I'm not going to spoil it for you. You can, if you want to watch the video, it's up to you. And it involves Letitia Bursko, who later came to work in said Catholic school in Clitheroe. So of course that was my old primary school, I went to a Catholic school. So naturally as part of the research to try to understand a bit more about the history of the school, I also looked into some old early Catholic resources. In the year 1767 a return of papists was taken. It was a kind of census, but it was just about Catholic people. In Clitheroe, Lancashire, there were only 12 identified on the returns, including this couple. William K was born in about 1707. His wife Isabel was born about 1716. And they have lived in the town of Clitheroe since around about 1740. We don't know exactly, but that's the information that they are giving us. They've run an inn, but otherwise we don't really know too much about them. Yet. A notice in the Manchester Mercury announced that a Mr John Parkinson, an attorney from Clitheroe, had died and anyone who owed him money was ordered to come to a meeting on the 10th of December to pay up or they faced being sued to reclaim the money back on behalf of John Parkinson's estates, I suppose. And where was this meeting held? At the house of Mr William Kay being the sign of the black bull in Clitheroe. So William Kay ran the black bull. Three years earlier we find the London Gazette tells us that the bankruptcy hearing concerning a John Rimmington, a chapman from Blackburn, would be held at the house of Mr William Kay, being the sign of the black bull in Clitheroe once again at 11 o'clock in the morning on the 25th of May. From pieces of information that I've gleaned, um, items on the Lancashire Archives catalogue, I think I've found some evidence to suggest that the Black Bull was on Castle Street, so that's the main street going through town, uh, obviously goes downhill from the castle. By focusing just on this one place now, on the Black Bull, we can learn more about other things that were going on in Clitheroe at around about the time when these returns of Papists were taken in 1767. Let's see what was going on. In winter of 1771, two local bridges, the Upper Hodder and Stevens Bridge, needed to be rebuilt. Two others, Evesford or Edisford as it's now called, and Witter needed to be widened. So on the 11th of November 1771, we find another report showing that a meeting was being called for local workmen to put forward their estimates for those projects. They seem to be done by private contractors then. So these workmen are basically bidding for work. They're putting 
for the proposal we can imagine they might have sat down individually beforehand in their offices or their homes or whatever they worked from each working out their idea of what it would cost them to renovate the bridges how they would get the materials and how they would bill the people that were commissioning it in order to make a profit for themselves of course because they're not going to work for nothing and the bidding meeting was held at the house of Isabel Kay which is the black bull in Clitheroe so another connection there to Isabel Kay but unfortunately the proper number of referees didn't turn up so could this be that the workmen needed to also supply something else that they didn't have that they had to bring to that meeting could be something like a reference from a previous customer to prove that their work was up to standard because really a bridge is not something that you want to get wrong on the 3rd of december 1771 so not much later the manchester mercury announces a second meeting to be held on the 18th of december that's quite close to christmas and once more it is hosted in the inn run by Isabel Kay. According to the parish records that I've looked at, I think William Kay, Isabel's husband, had actually died in March of 1769, which would explain definitely why Isabel was in charge of the Black Bull in the early 1770s. By the time she was buried in 1774, if we use the papist returns and those earlier Manchester Mercury references too, Isabel has been linked with the Black Bull for at least 17 years and depending on when she got married it could actually be even longer than that. In the 18th century an awful lot of business was actually done in pubs and in property auctions and sales, other announcements, there's all sorts of life is there and these occasions, for want of a better word, were frequently advertised in the regional newspapers as we've seen. For instance if several different lots of land were for sale or auction these notices could actually become quite lengthy. I thought that I'd use William and Isabel Kay as something of a starting point to talk about a couple of interesting extracts that I found completely by chance that take us back to Clitheroe as it was about 225 years ago, not too long after William and Isabel Kay had died. This is the world that they didn't quite get to see. It could be an interesting exploration now. edge of the town, just off Woon Lane, there is a body of water which is known as Primrose Lodge. A second smaller lodge was tucked in between the junction of Woon Lane and Worley Road, the main road going to Worley strangely enough. I had for the ducks there when I was small, the, the big lodge as I remembered it which is closest to the main road. It's much much older than I am by a long way. <laughs> And I'm told that it was once used as rinsing water for the nearby Primrose Mill, which actually closed in 1890. And that area has now been redeveloped into Primrose Nature Reserve today, and it's only been open very recently, around about Easter. Both lodges are actually shown on the 1844 Ordnance Survey map. But it turns out that the mill that they served was even older than that that some property was being sold at auction by the order of the assignees of Mr John Parker, a bankrupt. The auction was to take place once again at an inn at the house of Widow Taylor, innkeeper, in Slayburn, about nine miles away. I'm not entirely sure which hostelry that would have been. It could have been the Harker Bounty, it could have been another one. But the auction took place at 6 o'clock in the evening on Wednesday the 3rd of January 1798. So really specific information you get. And this property that was being sold was divided into 29 lots. A couple of interesting ones are found here. Lot 24. All that one plot or parcel of land with two cottages standing thereupon. 
situate near the stock well within Clitheroe aforesaid, containing upwards of half an acre of land, now in the possession of Robert Parkinson Jr., Ellen Place, the said John Parker, James Hargreaves, and James Sellers as tenants thereof. It's, it's very, very archaic language, but you get the general impression of what they're trying to say. Uh, two cottages, very, very close to the castle grounds where the park is today. And fortunately, I have a picture which we can use by way of illustration, so you know what I'm talking about. Then we've got lot 29. All that barn situate within Clitheroe aforesaid called Dovecote, and the meadow adjoining the same called Dovecote Meadow, of course, together with several closes or parcels of land nearly adjoining to Primrose Mill in Clitheroe aforesaid, containing about 50 acres of land, now in the possession of the said Thomas Brennan as farmer thereof. Note, these premises are held by lease from Thomas Weld Esquire for the term of 21 years from the 2nd of February 1787 under the yearly rent of £49. But here's a strange thing. According to Baldwin and Alexander's 1822 map of Clitheroe, which I found in a book in the public library in, in Clitheroe, Thomas Weld had a piece of land called Dovecote Croft, just off Lowergate, which he leased to Stephen Sparrow. Stephen Sparrow, I think, was his land agent or something of that kind. He was um, a Catholic man, definitely. But Lowergate was in the centre of the town, and Primrose Mill is on the southern edge of the town. So I'm not sure whether this Lot 29 that's up for auction is just a mixed bag, a lucky dip of property scattered all across Clitheroe, or whether Dovecote Croft and Dovecote Meadow are actually one and the same. I think it's more than remotely possible. John Parker is mentioned in the Clitheroe section of the Universal British Directory, which gives us a really good description of how the cotton industry was thriving in East Lancashire in the 18th century, because this is the point where the Industrial Revolution is really getting into its swing. The cotton manufacture has extended itself from Blackburn to this town it's spreading. Three very considerable factories for spinning cotton have been established here within these few years and which afford employment to a great many persons. Of these mills, Messrs John and John Parker and Company are proprietors. These gentlemen have also lately established a bank in the town, so they are men of many trades. And sure enough, Amongst the list of principal traders in the town, we also find Parker, Messrs John and John and Company, bankers and cotton manufacturers. So this raises a new question. In 1791, John Parker was clearly doing quite well. If he is able to op operate a cotton factory and run a bank, I don't know how he's managing that, but he is. So what happened to make him sell those 29 pieces of property eight years later. Well, perhaps the answer lies in an incident that took place in the same year that the Universal British Directory was published. On Tuesday morning last, so that's the 15th of November, about two o'clock, the large and valuable cotton mill belonging to Messrs Parker and Company of Clitheroe, Lancashire, unfortunately caught fire and in less than three hours it was entirely consumed. With about 60 hundredweight of cotton wool, eight packs of twist, all the machinery and books of accounts. As a family history researcher, as any kind of historical researcher, my heart is sinking there. They've lost the accounts books. They've lost documents relating to this business and we know that they are never going to come back. That's heartbreaking from a research perspective. 
and also from a financial perspective too, because the loss is estimated upwards of £12,000. But we are happy to say £5,000 of it was insured. But it looks like the sale of January 1798 wasn't enough to solve John Parker's problems. The London Gazette, which is a fantastic resource for all things bankruptcy related and other financial business type dealings, it goes back to the 1650s, I think, 1660s, announced that the commissioners in John Parker's bankruptcy order would meet at 12 noon on the 3rd of August 1798 in the house of John Wigglesworth innkeeper in Worley. So we've got another publican. And eight months later, by order of the assignees, Mr. John Parker, a bankrupt, an auction is held at another pub. We, you guessed, you saw that coming, didn't you? In Clitheroe. At 6pm on Tuesday the 5th of March 1799, you could bid for any of four lots of property relating to John Parker's bankruptcy. And that trade directory from 1791 actually says that Thomas Hyde was the landlord of the Old King's Head. You used resources to cross over and cross-reference there and you find something out about Thomas Hyde. And a document that is held at the Lancashire Archives from six years earlier says that John Parker had leased this inn on Market Street to somebody or other and presumably they then had sublet it to Thomas Hyde and ironically that is where John Parker's property ends up being auctioned off. So the auction was really well advertised. Three weeks earlier the Manchester Mercury described the properties including Lot number three. All that other building, now used as a cotton mill or factory, situate in the township of Clitheroe aforesaid called Primrose Mill, with eleven cottages, stable and shipping, and the gardens and pieces of land thereunto adjoining, containing half an acre of land, and the land upon which the said mill, cottages, stable and shipping are erected. Because after all, think about it, how else are people going to get fresh milk? They're not going to go and buy it from the supermarket in the chiller cabinet in 1798, are they? They're going to get it straight from the cow. It goes on to say, The last mentioned factory is four storeys in height, 70 feet in length, 31 feet in breadth, within the walls and situated on the banks of two brooks or river, called the Shea Brook and Pendleton Brook, and with two reservoirs or dams adjoining there too what we now know as the lodges, one of them covering better than half an acre of land and the other near a quarter of a mile in length, and about four yards in breadth upon an average, together with the machinery therein consisting of five sets of tumming engines, I'm not sure what a tumming engine is, nine finishing machines, three drawing frames, one stretching frame consisting of 92 spindles, nine spinning frames containing 64 spindles each, five ditto containing 56 spindles each, four reels, a picking machine, a large lathe, together also with a water wheel and a bright shaft, about 24 feet high and five feet broad. That's a big water wheel. So this is quite a well-equipped cotton mill. So the premises in these lot, it goes on to say, are held by lease from Thomas Weld of Stonyhurst, Esquire, he's a gentleman, for the remainder of a term of 90 years, commencing from the 2nd of February 1787, subject to the small annual rent of £20. And that date of 1787 ties in exactly with the details on the information board and what is now Primrose Nature Reserve. So I think it's probably time we had a quick look at that. So somehow, one little extract that started off being a list of Catholics has led us to discover that the innkeepers William and Isabel Kay of Clitheroe ran an establishment called the Black Bull, and that a few years later, John Parker, another resident in the town, 
owned a cotton factory that took up more than 2100 square feet and was built on land owned by the family who owned the property that we now call Stonyhurst College. So we've gone from a Catholic link to an Anglican to a Catholic one again. And the parish registers for St Mary Magdalene, the Anglican parish church in Clitheroe, do actually show us that a John Parker, the son of John Parker of Merley, was baptised on New Year's Day 1757. A John Parker, attorney at law of Clitheroe, is buried at the same church on the 24th of October 1812. So if that is our John Parker, we also know that he lived to be about 55. And whether or not he got married is something that I haven't quite been able to establish. But I think that now we, we actually know a little bit more about the family background and the business adventures of the man who ran what was once Primrose Mill, which has now become the nature reserve that was featured in my last video. So we've gone full circle effectively which is a nice way to finish, I think.